All right, so right after, right before the break, we ended up creating uh, our Hello Taco basic project. It's, it's on the device. Now, I've got a bunch of little windows open. Uh, I've got the web browser, I've got some folders. But notice one of them is the command prompt. Uh, we, when we went to the to start, remember we typed node and then there was command prompt. That's just a slightly rebranded version of the plain old command prompt that's in the computer in Windows, command prompt. If you're on the Mac, you're going to use terminal, and if you're on Linux, well, you know what you're doing. So uh, here on uh, the command prompt, this is where we're going to be typing all our commands and such. Another one opened up over here with the little Android logo. That one doesn't isn't really doing anything except that that was the one that when I did taco uh, emulate Android, this started up on its own and then it loaded up the emulator and then that one spawned this one right like this. I believe if we close that one, then the other one closes. Uh, yes. Okay. So don't close either one of them. Uh, if you close the if you close the emulator, you have to wait for it to come back. If you close the the intermediary window that opened the emulator, it closed the emulator. So, no problem, because what I want to do is this. Where is this project? We can access it with Windows Explorer. There's no nothing wrong with that. We're going to do that right now. It's just that most of the time we will be running the basic commands here. Taco create, taco build, taco emulate, taco run. Uh, eventually we're going to be doing taco uh, deploy or whatever. We're going to be doing the taco commands in the command prompt, but we're still going to be over at the uh, over at Notepad++ and such. We'll still be writing code like we've been doing before. It's now that this is part of the mix. So I'm going to minimize the command prompt there, and um, on uh, on our Windows Explorer here, I guess just uh, double click computer icon at the top left. And then on the left side, um, click on the name of your user. Yours is lab, mine is instructor. But on the left side, do you see a little user folder? Yours is lab. Click on it. <coughs> so I'm in, my, I'm in the lab folder. I'm in my user folder. And inside of that folder, if you scroll down and you look around, you should see my project. So it is a real folder that was created that you can access no problem with Windows Explorer and eventually we'll do this so that our project is on our flash drive right now it's not on your flash drive of course if you move it over don't do that because that'll be a problem but the project is right there and it's telling me it's about four and a half megabytes really small project really lightweight as we start adding to it it'll get bigger of course and if we add more platforms it'll get much bigger but it's all based on this original core code question Back there. So let's check it out. That's my project. Double click it so we can view it in Explorer. Yes. So when you do it like um, for other platforms, does it create that one folder or is it a folder for each of the platforms? We're going to see that right now. All of the platforms and everything about the projects are all in that one folder. That's the great thing about this. Oh, the whole project. Your whole project is this one folder, and therefore you can take it home, take it to someone else. Your whole, everything about it is in that one folder. So if you open up my project, we have a bunch of these files here, www, plugins, platforms, merges, hooks. Inside of platforms, that's where it's going to then have the specific code for the specific platform. Right now we've only got Android. Is there a special import if I need to change the no. It's just drag and drop. You need to make sure you've got Taco set up on the other machine. That's it. You don't really have to do any exporting or importing or refactoring or anything like that. All right, so we've got a bunch of things here. Let's look inside this res folder. I believe it stands for resources. Open up that res folder, and then it's going to, again, be divided up into different things. Icons, native screens. Open icons. And in icons, here's the icons for the Windows project, the iOS project, the Android project. Open the Android project, and here's the little thumbnails that are the icon for your project when it's installed on the device. I have handouts, of course, and I keep saying that they're coming, coming soon. But I have handouts where 
basically, if you design icons and replace these, you've got new icons for your app. If we back up, back to icons, back to res, go over to screens, go to Android, these are the splash screens. Whenever an app loads up, there's often a little splash screen that shows you some little bit of branding for a moment. Here we go. The landscape one, the portrait one, and a bunch of different ones because there is the high quality one, there is the low quality one, the medium quality, etc. The portrait version, the landscape version. So again, if I swap out my graphics for these graphics, I've just changed my splash screen. For my project, what's the what's the sizes? I've got it in the handout, but you can click on one time, and it should tell you at the bottom that one's 640 by 480. So we'll be able to do that to to make ourselves look even more official. We're going to have our own icon, not that Cordova icon uh, on on the device. You're going to have your icon. We'll, we'll have a day about that where we design app assets. We're going to pull up Photoshop and actually make some graphics. Because again, if you're an app developer, you're the only one in the company, you're going to need to do it all. Not only the programming, which you may be very comfortable with, but the graphics too. And you will see that then a lot of people are going to freak out about that because I can't draw a straight line. <laughs> no problem. Photoshop will help us. Or any other software. Graphic software. So I'm making you aware of that. Uh, we'll, be re we'll be reviewing this res folder later. Let's go back to my project. Um, the big crux of things is going to be www folder. Look in that folder. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all the stuff from last month, all the stuff that we are proficient with, it's all in here. If you look inside the CSS, there's just a very simple CSS file. Inside of images, it's just a picture. Scripts has a JavaScript, a couple of them, an index. Go into the CSS file, right click that CSS file, and edit in Notepad some CSS, some starting points, sizes of fonts. Oh, look, here's how they're showing that icon in the background Cordova background, JPEG, or PNG. So if you mess with any of this, it'll change the project. Don't mess with it yet. Let's go back to the WW folder. Let's go into the scripts folder. Open the index.js file. We will change something here. There's some JavaScript. Some of it looks a little familiar. Somewhat. A lot of it doesn't. But I've got some JavaScript here. Maybe I don't know exactly what it does. There's some comments. That's helpful. Function on pause. This application has been suspended. Save application state. So we'll explain what this on device ready is and all of that. But if I poke around a little bit, line 13, device is ready. When I loaded it up on my emulator, it said device ready. This is a place where I can change that. So just for fun, to see that this is our work process, we're going to make changes to our code, we're going to save it, and we're going to build it again. So let's make a change on line 13. Instead of device ready, write anything else that you want here. I'm going to write ready to rock. Element.inner HTML, I don't know what that means. Equals ready to rock, OK. Something that says ready here also. Well, I'll just change this for the moment. I'll change that to something else. Line 13. Make sure you don't change anything else at the moment besides what was in the single quotes. Save that JS file, a JavaScript file. Go back to the node command prompt. We're going to type taco emulate Android again. You have to do that again to rebuild the project, to redeploy it. So back to the command prompt, taco, emulate, Android, and enter. 
It's a rebuild. What's that? Don't don't close the AVD. Leave that open. I I closed it just to prove a point, but don't close it because mine's going to take a little longer to load up. Yours is just going to be ready to go. Yeah, you don't need to close the AVD, the Android Virtual Device. Um, that'll just slow down your development process, like me. So what you should see is that after you do Taco Emulate Android, eventually it'll punch it all, it'll launch it, and then it'll say ready to run, or whatever you want. So did you guys, do you guys see your new message? Question? So again, this is a big change in, in process. We're used to icons and such. We're going to be used to doing it this way. You can see it's not so So if you closed your emulator, you have to wait for it to come back, like I did, and mine says ready to watch. So I'm just showing you, you edit our code, you run a taco command, you see the result. All right, so I changed that. Um, that was a little bit of JavaScript. Why JavaScript? We'll get into the details, but JavaScript is very important now with our project. JavaScript is uh, going to let us do so much. At a certain point, the project loaded up into the device, and it had to check that everything was ready, and then it showed that. We can make this do whatever we want, of course, but many times we'll be using a lot of JavaScript. And notice in this blank project, the CSS file had a few built-in design elements. The index, uh, the JavaScript file has about 25 lines of code. We'll break down what all of that means. Let's go look at the uh, index file now. Go ahead and open your index.html file. This one's only got about 25 lines of code also. And you've got a few comments here. You've got some meta tags pointing to a style sheet. Here's a viewport set up right there. This viewport is a little bit different than the one we used previously. This is a little bit more accurate also. Um, there's a couple of things here though. Format detection, telephone, no. 
and MS applications have highlight. No. These are just uh, built-in basic things that we need to use <coughs> because the evolution of mobile devices has not been what people expected. Um, people expected perhaps to use a meta tag telephone equals yes to make it behave like a mobile device. It, instead it ended up going to different directions. So right here we're sort of saying don't rely on the old telephone format that's outdated, so that's no. Basically these defaults that are here are here for a reason. They're defaults. They, they will work for us. One big thing, line 8, that we're honestly going to struggle with, but it's a modern concept, is the CSP, Content Security Policy. This is a way for your projects to be more secure because JavaScript could be very insecure. There's these XSS exploits, cross-site scripting exploits, where one piece of JavaScript is on one server and that's messing with another server. Our project is JavaScript-based and we could set ourselves up that we have a server, we've got our JavaScript on our server, it's doing all this cool stuff. We could get hacked on our server and then suddenly that JavaScript code on that server is collecting all the credit cards of our app. So we have to have a content security policy, we'll go into detail later, but all of these things that say what, are, what can or can we or we cannot do via JavaScript. At the moment it's very restrictive, but we will change it as we understand what this means later. And what I mean struggling by it, or struggling with it, is because again it's very restrictive. The easy way to handle this is to delete that line or comment it out, but then you no longer have the most secure type of project. You could be vulnerable to XSS. And I say that because these app stores are getting smarter and smarter. They're seeing that more people are uploading hybrid apps like us, and they want those to be as secure as possible. So if you, up, if you submit a, a project without the CSP, it might not be accepted. It might say, your, your project's a security vulnerability. So then we have to learn, how does this actually work? And there's a link there. Microsoft left, left us a link here. You know, look at this and learn about it. Title, body with some divs and IDs connecting to device. While the project is loading, for a moment it says connecting to device. You probably didn't notice it because it loaded so quickly. It's a basic project. But that could be a message there that appears while it's loading. Some JavaScript libraries. It's pointing to the index.js index file. Platform overrides. We can have code that is targeted specifically to specific platforms. I can have JavaScript or CSS or HTML code that works for iPhone, Android, etc. Or I can write code that only applies to iPhone, that only applies to Android. Those are overrides. So that's how I can make my core project look and behave differently per platform if I want to. If I don't, it'll look and behave the same way on all platforms, a little easier. In a very important line, 21, a reference to Cordova.js. That's the magic. That's what takes all of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and converts it to every platform, basically. That reference to that file. And the thing about it that's a little odd is that within the folder, do you see any disconnect? Let's see, JavaScript, Cordova, index, scripts, index, scripts, platforms, scripts, platforms, index. Do you notice anything? Oh, Cordova.js is Exactly. The actual JS file, you're not going to see it in the folder. I don't know why. You just don't worry about it. You're not going to see the Cordova file here. But you better have a reference to it in your code. When we take our project from last month and bring it into this project, it will almost work if we simply drag and drop all of that stuff into this folder. It will almost work. It needs to reference the JS file and other things, which we'll do. But that's why I really like teaching this this way. You can take any web project. You can make a Dreamweaver project, fully responsive HTML5 Dreamweaver project. Use Taco, drop that project in here, and it almost basically works with what else other things we'll learn. So that's the big secret. Don't tell anyone else how easy to make 
and easy it is to make apps. Well, it took us three months to learn, or two months to <laughs> So this project then, my project, this is just our very first step into this larger world. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close the My Project folder. I'm going to close all of these files in Notepad that I had open. Go to File, Close All. <coughs> Minimize Notepad. Minimize my emulator. I'm going to use it again. Well, actually, what I like to do is go back home on the emulator and then minimize it. I like to go back home. That way I know that the latest thing that is displayed is my latest project. I'm not going to close it, although for a couple of you it looks like you had to close it in order to build your project again. Sometimes this stuff is finicky. You just do it again and then it works. But I'm going to minimize the emulator. Something about Notepad. Forget that. Um, minimize command prompt. Sometimes I call it command prompt. Sometimes I'll call it node. Technically it's the command prompt node branded. But I'm going to minimize that. And now let's go to the network folder and show you some handouts. Go back to computer, back to classroom data network location, drive Z, back to Andro Campus Android 2, and I've added two items here. You want to drag these two to your desktop or flash drive. Again, the printer is off at the moment. During the next break, you can print. And what I'll be talking about most of the time, I'll be following those as much as possible step by step. I might deviate here and there, but everything that I'm going to talk about is in these handouts. And I double check, I triple check them this morning. It should work. Again, I've tested this on a bunch of computers uh, Windows 7, Windows 8, on a Mac, uh, on Windows 10. I've tested it on a bunch of computers, a bunch of. Uh, processors and hard drives and it works. Sometimes you struggle a little bit more, sometimes it works right away. And to my knowledge, this will work pretty easily in this room because I've tweaked these computers. On your own computer, hopefully, you can follow the instructions, I can help you as best as possible. But anyway, go ahead and drag those two over and let's look at number one. Node.js, Cordova Taco. This is assuming you're going to do it at home because it's done here. At home, you need to go to nodejs.org and download and install that. Node.js is the foundation to use Taco. So you need to download and install it. And then in your start menu, you will have a brand new app, Node Command Prompt. This works on Windows, works on Mac, works on Linux. Then you need to open Command Prompt and set up Taco. That's npm installed dash g taco cli. Okay, now you've got taco create, taco build. So two pieces of software. Then in my case here, I've got, okay, change directory, taco create, test one. We simply created, we simply ran taco create my project. A full command is actually taco create the name of the folder, the package ID, which is a reverse URL, com.urlastname.test1, same name as the folder. And what that is is the unique ID that we, when we submit to the App Store, this app, this unique ID, will delineate your app from everyone else's. Have you noticed there's a lot of calculator apps? There's a lot of uh, step tracking apps. There's a lot of flashlight apps. There's a lot of apps that do the same thing. And maybe many of them have the exact same name. Flashlight, flashlight, flashlight. Uh, well, how can you have so many different versions of flashlight? They all have a unique ID here. You can set it here. And you don't have to have a real website for this. When we do this in a moment for real, I'm going to recommend you simply type com dot your last name dot the name of the project. Here's the name of the project right there. Notice this is all lowercase. This can be changed, of course, if I misspell it, or I want to change it later. I'll show you how, of course. But this is the full taco process. And then at the end, in quotes, is what you type to appear below the icon. 
we didn't specify anything, so it became Hello Taco. But when we run the command with a little more knowledge, in quotes, if we put whatever we want there, that's what will appear below the icon. When you've got your icon installed, the name of your app, right there, in quotes. We ran that, it did stuff, you get quick tips, you can do taco help to get more commands. We did CD test 01, CD because we need to change directory, we need to go into the directory, into the folder, to do the next commands. We did taco platform add Android. Let me do a segue here. Go back to your command prompt. I've still got it open. I'm still inside my project. This time, just type taco platform. Enter. This version of taco will then tell us which platforms have we installed. We've got Android 4.1.1, which is different than that Android 5.0, 6.0 thing. It doesn't exactly match up. This is different. Don't worry about that. But we've got Android in this project, and it says you can also do Amazon Fire OS, Blackberry, Browser, Firefox <coughs> OS, Web OS, Windows, Windows 8, Windows Phone. What's missing? iOS. iOS, so we can't do iOS because we need a Mac to do it. And I just heard about this other the other day. Apparently, you can buy, you can rent Macs, you can rent a Mac online. Now, I didn't fully check what that means, but someone mentioned it on Stack Overflow that if you get an account at this company, you rent a Mac. You know, it's on their co-location servers or whatever, and then you're running a Mac somehow. I don't know if I... Maybe. What's that? Not myself very recently, since I have a few Macs to work with, but isn't it a problem, the whole licensing? Bec you license copy of yeah. The yeah, you still need to pay the $90 or whatever, 20 whatever, to buy the OS. But to my knowledge, I thought you couldn't emulate Macs because it also needed hardware support, something like that. Yeah, but they have these... Uh, for example, on my Mac, mm -hmm. I'm running Windows. Yeah, that's that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, within, uh, you know, VMware. Yeah. yeah. And I've run um, Linux within VMware on Windows before. Yeah, that's easy. I just have not tried the Mac OS. To yeah. my knowledge, if you're on Windows and you try to emulate a Mac, I believe it's not that easy. Okay. Other people have told me also, and I've tried it myself. Because when you're running Mac OS on Mac hardware, it checks for hardware that it exists, which the emulators can't emulate. So that's why you're stuck with doing iOS development on a Mac. But vice versa, you can do Android app development on a Mac and Windows and so forth. Over here? Yeah, you can have Macs and then run Parallel on mm -hmm. there and then load the Windows OS on Mac and then do both. True, but what about backwards? Many of us have Windows. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. You'd have to do it through the Mac. Yeah, the Mac, doing it the Mac is a little bit of the better way because with the Mac you can run Windows, not that hard. If you're on Windows to run Mac, that's a little hard. So if you're on Mac, you can create Android apps, iPhone apps, etc. We've got Windows, so we've got Windows. But yeah, Windows 10 is also missing because we don't have Windows 10 machines. If we had a Windows 10 machine, it would also let us do Windows 10. But uh, what's also missing is Mac OS. If I wanted to make apps for the Mac, for the MacBook and such, I can do that with Cordova. But it's not available because of my current platform. Yes? I cannot run this online. You can, but you can't create a Mac app. You can create a Windows, you can create an Android app, a Windows app, a Blackberry app, uh, Amazon, etc., but not Mac app, iOS. Browser is one that we will be using for helping us debugging. It's Google Chrome browser. Oh. So that one's pretty helpful, as we'll see. But when you go home and try this on your Mac, and you do Taco Platform, you'll have these plus a few that we don't have. 
further on my handout here, um, we did Taco Platform and Android. One that we did not do, and we, we don't need to do it here, it's already done for us, but you need to do this one. Make a note of number six. You're at home, you do these steps, then you have to do number six. Taco install Rex Android. Taco install requirements. Because we went over to developer.android.com. And I said that's where you download the whole source code for Android. You go there and you download all of what Android is at developer.android.com um, if you were going to use Android Studio. But here Taco makes it so easy. You run Taco install Rex, Taco install dash Rex Android, and it will tell you. You need to download Java, you need to download Android. SDK, you need to download Android AVDs, virtual devices. Would you like to proceed? It'll download 500 megabytes of stuff. You click yes, or you type yes, press enter, and then it does it unattended. You've got all the software. The same thing will happen. Taco install Rex iOS, because iOS requires Xcode. For Android, you use Android Studio, traditionally. For iOS, you use Xcode. That's another multi hundred megabyte download. And so on your Mac, you would do ta you would type taco install rex iOS, and it would download all the software, set it all up, makes it so easy. Again, I've taught this class three years. So many people almost get it working. They bring in their laptop, we figure out the one little tweak that their laptop needed, and it looks like taco can take care of it all. Yes? So once you <clears throat> install Node.js, you just run the Number two, once you install Node.js, type npm install g taco clean, and then you get taco. Um, you might have to restart command prompt because you've added new stuff, so I'm just saying you type exit and restart command prompt. That's already done for us. And then I've got a big block of stuff here, number eight. Right now, our project, our template project, can't do anything on the device. It cannot access the camera, the accelerometer, all that cool stuff that a real app can. So we have plugins. If you've taken, for example, WordPress, we talk about plugins there. Plugins are in a lot of software, which are little extra things that you add to your project. And we have Taco Plugin Add. Cordova-plugin-battery-status. If we run that command, now our HTML project with a little JavaScript can access the battery status of your device. What's the point of that? We check battery status, and if it's under 20%, deactivate the camera, let's say. If, you, if your battery falls within a certain threshold, then pop up a screen from your app that says, please charge your, your phone. We can do taco plugin add Cordova plugin camera. And now with a little JavaScript, our app can take a photo. I'm stringing all of the plugins into one. Taco plugin add battery space camera space console space contacts space device. All of these things, media capture, I'm stringing them all together into one taco command. But technically, it would be taco plugin add Cordova dash plugin dash splash screen. I can add one at a time. Here, we've activated all of the features, all of the permissions. When you download or an update an app, it tells you this app is requesting to do this. Check your camera, check your contacts, save files, permissions. And sometimes you look at an app and says, why is it asking me to get into the contacts? Is it going to spy on my contacts? Well, what we've done here is we've said, give us all the permissions. And later, we will weed out the ones we don't need. It's just that I would rather activate and ask for all of the features of the device now, and then later deactivate some, than having to remember, oops, I haven't added that permission yet. I'm going to request all permissions do my work, at the end of my project, remove that um, file transfer. I'm not using file transfer, so I'll remove it. Is that the kind of um, authorization that kind of like generates 
you know, like uh, when someone plays Candy Crush and you keep getting those invites, it's built in. Is that what it, it's not really the person playing actually inviting people, it's, it's because they got this. It's somewhat related to that in that many of these modern apps will check your address book, for example, and it'll tell you, your friend is also playing Candy Crush. Why not connect with them? This is a permission to check your, your address book. This is a permission to use your camera to record your voice. So what you're saying might not be exactly that, but it is asking you for permission for something. And that's right here we've asked for all the permissions. And if we're making, you know, a calculator app, why would we be asking to record you on the camera? But for our purposes, we, we're asking for all permissions, and then later we remove them. Taco, plugin, remove the plugin. So a little info there, taco build. Taco build is actually a bit superfluous. We did taco create, taco platform add, and then Taco Build Android, and then Taco Emulate Android. Taco Build is actually not really necessary, because if you simply do Taco Emulate Android or Taco Run Android, it will do build anyway. So I might have said, we need to edit our code and rebuild our project. We can do Taco Build and then Taco Emulate, but that will automatically build it anyway. Sometimes I do want to build it, but I don't want to emulate it. I know it works. You shouldn't think like that, but you could just do taco build and you're done. Call it a day. Um, usually we'll be doing taco emulate or taco run Android if you've got a real device. Um, so I go on here, taco emulate Android. This will create a, this will load up a virtual device, test your project. If there's an error at this point, you need to go on to step two, another handout full of steps. If it did work, then okay, your project works. And your project is inside of whatever, wherever it's saved to, C drive or whatever, half the project, project name, in the www folder. You're usually going to be editing things in the www folder, the web, the web aspect of it. And then to further learn how it all works, we're going to be referring back to cordova.apache.org. How does it take a camera shot? How does it save a file to the memory card? It's all right there. Modern methods of JavaScript all documented at that website. And then, of course, what's the other place for you to learn everything about programming and ask questions? Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow, where people are doing programming in every language and, and helping each other out. So. We'll do this together again in, in a bit. I want to go over an overview and see and show you that, yeah, it's a big wall of instructions, but you don't have to do some of them. Some of them you do once. You set yourself up, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a template file. We're going to set it all up with our developer name and all of that stuff. We'll set it all up, and then when we want to create a new project, we don't have to go back to Cordova Create again. We can simply copy the project folder, and you've got a new app. The project folder, my project right here, if I simply copy that elsewhere, that's a new app. That's it. Based on what I did on the previous version. It has that name and it has that icon and such, but that's a project. I can then open the command prompt there and go back again to taco build, taco add iOS, all of that. That's a complete project. Let's open up handout number two. Campus 2 set up AVD. AVD is Android Virtual Device. Most of the time, if you've got a real device, you will be using a real device. It's, it's better. It's tactile and it actually vibrates and plays sounds and the virtual device has limitations. But the point of possibly still wanting to use a virtual device is I have this 5-inch Android phone and I also want to test my project to look nice on a 10-inch tablet. I'm not going to go out, run out and buy a 10-inch tablet. I'm going to create a virtual device that is a 10-inch tablet and test my projects there. 
So let's talk about this one. This is a very technical one. We don't have to do this here in this lab. It's done for us, but you will have to do this most likely at home. I've got a section, set up the Android SDK manager and set up an Android virtual device. Go ahead and open a, another computer window. I'm going to go to the C drive, so open local disk C, program files x86. We have program files and program files x86. Open the x86 folder. Android folder, Android SDK Windows folder, and then here you've got ADD Manager and SDK Manager, SDK Software Development Kit. That's where you manage your code. Do you have the latest version of the code, of the software, of, of the tools? ADD Manager is where you create uh, virtual devices and such. Let's look at the SDK manager. So you want to right click it. I've noticed this for some computers. It seems to work better if you do it this way. Don't double click it. Right click it. Run as administrator. You should get a little flash and then wait a moment. The rest of the instructions, we don't need to do them in this room. They're done for us. But what I'm saying here is, this is telling us, okay, we've got Android SDK version 24.3.3, and now we've got 24.4.1. So this is where we would update our software, just like we update our phone's software, or we update Photoshop, or we update uh, you know, any, of, any software. We would update it here. We got these are the ones installed, they're current. It's suggesting why not download the Android 6.0 code? We don't need to do it in this room because if we do it, it'll erase. Remember, we've got deep freeze. There's no point to updating to the latest software, it's just going to erase. But on your home computer, it would say download the Android 6 software. Documentation, the platform, why not download the code to create Android TV apps? download to create Android Wear apps, you know, the, the wristwatch stuff, and a bunch of stuff here. We can easily get off track here at home. If you want to update to all, your late, to all the latest code, you could, but my handout rec tells you what you should at the minimum do. My handout tells you don't download any of it except for what's inside of the Android 5.11 section and you only need the Intel x86 Atom system image and uh, the emulator accelerator because we're running a little computer inside your big computer and your big computer most likely is running a, an Intel CPU maybe an AMD CPU it's running an Intel CPU a, a, a modern CPU that is actually different than the CPUs inside of these little guys. These oftentimes run an ARM CPU, different brains. And so here we're saying, let's download the Atom system image so that we can actually run it in the computer. And that's going to be slow because you're, running, you're trying to run one kind of CPU inside of another CPU. So down at the bottom, under Extras, we have this accelerator. This accelerator speeds it up. It works really well. I've tested it over the years without it, with it, and this makes it fly. If you don't have the accelerator active, your virtual device is going to be really slow. You're going to see it frame by frame flipping, not the smooth animation. And caveat already, if you've got an AMD CPU at home, not compatible. You need an Intel CPU for the speed boost. If your computer has an AMD chip, not compatible. The accelerator. The actual virtual device should work, but probably pretty slow. Different CPUs, different architecture. So again, a lot of moving pieces to this, isn't there? But it's a good thing I wrote it down, isn't it? Question. So do they have an emulator up there for an AMD? 
I think there is. I think you have to go over to developer.android.com and it'll tell you somewhere there. Um, but most CPUs are Intel. That's why I've got it listed here. But there should be one for AMDs as well. So at home you would do this. Just my recommendations. Anything besides that, you're on your own because I'm only telling you what I know works. If you go off the beaten path, <coughs> Stack Overflow. And what I'm going to say about updating your software, don't do it while you're in the middle of a project. <coughs> I'm, on my, I'm working on my project. It's going to be the next, the next great American app. And I'm going to update to the latest version of my code, and suddenly everything breaks. And I have to figure out what's new, and how the code is new, and it affects my project, and I'm wasting time not, a, not finishing my project. In the middle of a project, don't update the SDK. Set it up now, maybe, and then get to work. And then if it tells you there's a new version, ignore it until your project is done so that you can learn what's new and then choose to update and then apply it to your projects. So in our class, we are not going to update any of our code. And it tells us there's a bunch that we can update, but don't. So for this class, this is just FYI. Go ahead and close it. We don't need the SDK manager. At home you will, but close it here. And that's, that's telling you here what you should do, what you should check on, what you should not. When you download the Haxum hardware accelerator manager, Haxum, when you download it, you have to install it. Don't forget to do this step at home. Then we got set up a virtual device. We had one built in for us, but possibly at home, when you go home, it's not going to work. When you go home and you follow my steps of instruction one, and you type taco emulate Android, probably it'll fail because you don't have a virtual device. I had to set one up here so that we're not wasting time setting it up. But on your home computer, make sure you do these steps here. In the same folder, Android SDK, do you see an AVD manager? You want to double click the AVD manager. Let's check it out. Double click AVD manager. It might flash for a moment and then pop up. And we've got this one built in a Nexus 5 running 5.11. We've got a virtual device here ready. But on your own home computer, this screen here will probably be empty. You don't get a virtual device automatically, perhaps. And so this manages our virtual devices. And here we've got templates. Let's take a look at templates, device definitions. I can create an Android TV 1080p device. Good luck running it on your computer, unless you've got the latest and the, the greatest, 16 gigs of RAM, i7 terabyte hard drive, but you can have, because that's going to suck up on its own, two gigabytes, just on its own. And it's going to want to create a 1920 by 1080p screen. And mine's only 1024. You can create the watch, the Android watch. That's only 320 by 320, but still half a gigabyte of RAM. Create some tablets, Nexus, notice its requirements. And then some generic ones, really low quality one, a 2.7 inch generic device, and just different devices that we can create. So we still might want to create virtual devices for testing on tablets, because I'm not going to go buy a tablet. Maybe I can go buy a $99 tablet and it'll be okay. But I don't want to spend $99 if I can create a, a virtual one here. This one for practice, let's actually do this one, my handout. Uh, switch to device definition, scroll down and click on the 3.2 inch QVGA ADP2. This is a relatively low quality Android device. And what I would say when you do this at home, create this one first. If your home computer cannot handle this low quality one, you're not going to be able to handle the higher quality devices that need more RAM and resources. So we're going to start off with a medium low quality one. Click on 3.2 inch QVGA ADP2. Be careful it's not the slider. Click on it once, and then click Create AVD at the top right corner. 
a bunch of stuff to fill in, but it's not so complicated. Name of the device, you can call it anything, my test device, whatever. This name is fine. It's a um, 3.2 inch device, don't worry about changing that, it's part of the template. Target, switch that to Google APIs in this case. It's a little different from what my handout says, don't worry about it. But this is going to be running Google Android 22, and we're going to see that Android has three ways to refer to it. API number, which is sequential from 1 to infinity. We've got also OS number, which right now the highest one is 6. And we've also got code names. Code names are alphabetical, based on sweets. The latest one is Marshmallow. Before that we had L. Lollipop. Before that we had, I can't say the backwards alphabet, before L. K. Before Kit Kat. Jelly Bean. So all of these sweets. In the beginning there was Cupcake. And then Donut. Eclair. Froyo. Etc. Alphabetically. Next is Android N. They're actually requesting people to suggest, what should we call Android N? I'm going to vote for Nutella. Android Nutella. That's one way to refer to it. Code names, I never remember those. There's OS version, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And there's API levels, which is 22 in this case, which is also 5.1.1. This is a little confusing, unfortunately, because sometimes the documentation tells us an API level and sometimes an OS level. You can keep them straight by looking at the SDK Manager. You don't have to do this, but let me show you. On the SDK Manager, API, tw uh, API 23 is Android 6. API 22 is 5. Now, it doesn't give you the code names here, but there's Android 2.2, API 8. 4.03 is 15. If you noticed when we did first Taco Create Android, it said it created a project API 22. So we have that basic 5.11 project. And so the point of this is um, what level of devices do we want to target? Do we want to target 22 and up? The problem with that is there's less and less devices that are running this older OS. They're also older, smaller screens, less RAM, older devices. Notice 3 isn't even here. That was like their Google's big mistake. So then it went on to 4.0 and up, and we've got a project, our project, we're going to target it that it starts on 14. 4.0 and up, so sorry Android 3 people and Android 2 people, our app will not work on your device. But even Google themselves at a certain point stops caring about older devices. They have to. How are they going to maintain legacy software for these things that a new one comes out every year, every six months? So we don't have to worry about it at the moment, but later on we'll see. We're going to target our device, our project to work on 14 and up. So 4x people, 5x, 6 Seven, yes. So what's the difference between you, between choosing Google API and the other one? Just for our case, my handout says something a little bit different, but on, on, on these labs, so my handout here says, uh, doesn't say anything. There's a default that should work on your own computer. The reason we're choosing Google here is there's a couple of ways to implement the code. The problem is if we have Android 5.1, it doesn't let us choose a CPU because we didn't download a compatible CPU. So we're just going to use the one that is installed on this computer. But if you follow the handouts at home, you're going to have Android 5.1 and CPU that says Android 5.1 Intel. It should work at home. That's one little thing I guess I forgot to do in this lab. Hardware keyboard present. It's going to be annoying to be clicking on the screen to type stuff on the screen. We're going to be able to use the keyboard. So make sure hardware keyboard is on. Sk 
skin, select the first one. Uh, a real device has buttons and it has uh, virtual buttons and such. Uh, I want to be able to see those in the virtual device, so turn on skin with dynamic hardware controls. This low quality old device did not have a front facing camera. Front facing is the one that faces you, of course. Back camera is the back camera. And here, this is cool, we can say back camera. If you're doing this on your laptop, you probably have a camera, and therefore you can select webcam. If a virtual device will tap into your real laptop's camera. If you've got a web camera like I've got right here, you can tap into it also. If you don't have either, you can select emulated. I'm going to select emulated at the moment because your computers don't have cameras. And it's not going to be that impressive, but you will be able to take photos with this virtual device. RAM, leave that alone. Internal storage, leave that alone. You can change it if you want, but leave them alone. And we need to plug in an SD card for when we take photos. Great. I plugging in a 99 megabyte SD card. Those don't exist. Don't worry. This is good enough. Why 99? Whatever. My hand was close to 99. I typed 99. <coughs> Emulation options. Um, snapshots are useful if we were <coughs> using Android Studio in that we can create a version of our project, make a snapshot, test the project, work on our project some more, and then, whoops, we made a bunch of errors, let's take it back to a backup. So snapshots are kind of like backups. For us, we're not going to use them because we're not using Android Studio, and we're using a simpler kind of project, HTML, CSS, and such. So we're not using snapshots. In this lab, we're not using the host GPU, but on your home computer, it may be useful to you. You won't know it until you try it. You've got this little mini computer. You've activated Intel Haxum, the hardware accelerator, and your device on your virtual device is still slow. One way to possibly speed it up is to also have the virtual device tap into the graphics processor. I have seen for some computers that it wasn't working very well, we turned on the GPU and now it works better. The virtual device now finally runs a little smoother because it's using an extra GPU of the computer. We don't seem to need it on these computers, so we won't turn it on, but on your own computer you might need it. Click OK. It'll think about it for a moment, maybe not give you any feedback, but then eventually you get a pop-up that says, this is what you did the big list of things that happened. Again, if it says not responding, just wait a moment. You're building a mini computer inside your computer. So if you'd like to try this on your own computers, bring your computers, hopefully we've got the space. But I see such a range of people's computers. Some works really well. Some work really well, some don't work so well, and some not at all. Yes? How does Windows 7 do? It doesn't quite matter the version of Windows, it really matters more your hardware. The better CPU that you have, the better RAM that you have in hard drive, that's what affects a bit more than the OS. Alright, so I created this device with all of these features, great, click OK. And then now what you want to do is um, <coughs> you want to select that AVD that you just created and click Start. A few options here. It's going to create it 320 by 480. Would you like to scale the display to a real size? <coughs> right now it's going to show on the screen pretty well, but if you want it to be sort of like pixel by pixel size on your screen, you want to turn on scale to display. We're not going to do it here, but if you want exactly three inches of screen on your device, on your desktop, you can turn that option on. Don't worry about it. We're going to use these devices, and if you were on your own home computer, you would be installing apps, you would be downloading stuff, 
you would be saving history, you would be using it like a real device. If you want to start over with a clean slate of a device, we can, write, we can wipe the data. You notice, if we chose snapshots, we can create snapshots, launch snapshots. You can't do it here because we didn't say back here to use snapshots, so don't worry. So we didn't do anything different here, just click launch. It's going to give you this feedback, launching it. If you've got the other emulator running, just leave it. Let's see how your computer handles it. You can have more than one emulator at once. But one emulator is taking this RAM, and this other emulator is taking that RAM, and two CPUs, and you've got four cores, and all of that. So on some computers that I've tested, I've been running three emulators at once, and it worked fine. And on others, one barely worked. Again, your computer will be different. I can't predict it. But as that starts up, go back to my handout. What else here? I just say, do that, launch the AVD, you can close the AVD manager, you don't need the AVD manager hanging around. Test the AVD, it's a real thing. I'm going to close my AVD manager, I don't need that. Now that I've got the emulator starting, I'm going to close the AVD. Don't close the AVD before you get the emulator running. I'm going to close the AVD manager. Free up a little bit of space on mine here. Uh, I'm going to close my web browser. Okay, so I've got a device. Welcome. Okay, got it. And right here, we've got a device. Very similar to the previous one, except this one's a little bit lower powered. Little camera here. There's my emulator camera. Take a photo of that wild green block running around. Snap the photo. Took a photo. This one's got these buttons on the side rather than the bottom. So home button takes you back home. Menu opens the menu. Back button. Search button. Power button. Click the power button and it goes into standby mode, or it should. Volume up and down. On my particular computer, perhaps because I've got my recorder that uses a lot of resources, it might, look it might not look exactly the same, but that's just a little bit there for you to do. So all of these instructions um, are here in the network folder. I'll turn the printer on a little bit later, but here we've got um, setting up the SDK manager and AVD. You definitely need to do this at home. Here we don't. We've got an AVD ready. Sheet number one. Um, this is sort of practice. Uh, we did a version of it. We didn't add the plugins we'll do it we'll do it a little later but again you should try to do these things at home definitely you need to install node or none of this will work you need node.js it's free software install it and then through node you need to install taco there's the command npm install taco and you do the rest we're going to do this once or twice, and then once we understand it, then we'll proceed and put our project back together. We'll do one one thing here for practice, and then we'll take a break. But any questions so far? Yes. Download Yes. 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 Right here. Once you've installed Node, in Node you're going to type Node npm install g taco, and that downloads it and installs it. Yeah. Exactly. Node is very powerful. It's like its own kind of mini app store now. There's lots of software that you can get this way. npm install Bower, and then you get that thing. npm install Angular, and you get the Angular framework. So npm, which is Node Package Manager, you do it here. 
let's do this then. So I'm going to minimize that uh, handout, uh, leave my emulator hanging around. Uh, I'm going to go back to the command prompt and go ahead and type exit and then press enter. Now sometimes it does actually close it and sometimes it doesn't. Mine didn't. If, if yours closed, great. Mine's supposed to close. It didn't. So close it with a little X like an app. There we go. I'm just trying to close it because what I want to do is what we this little quick test project we we saved it to this computer and again you can just move it out of the folder to your flash drive but let's get a little practice doing this let's say you've got your flash drive plugged in um, so I want to I want to uh, use node command prompt to create a project on my flash drive. Let's go through that process. I have it in another handout, but we'll do it together here first. Go back to the start menu and start typing node JS. And be careful here because you'll see node exe, which is not what you want. You want the one that says node command prompt. You get the command prompt. I've got a flash drive plugged in. And Windows Explorer tells me my flash drive is in drive F. Most of you are probably drive F. To switch into my flash drive, command prompt, it's not a directory, so we type F colon, enter. I'm on the F drive. If you tried to type F colon and it said cannot find the drive specified, your flash drive is plugged in and it has a different drive letter. So double check it over on computer. My flash drive is on F. Yours might be G or Q or K, I don't know. You have to check on your computer. It's F. If you don't have a flash drive, just wait a moment. We'll do it on the desktop. But let's say now I switched from my C drive to my F drive, and I want to view the contents of my F drive. We type the old command DIR. Press enter. Directory. Show me a directory listing of what I've got on the flash drive. And it tells me volume and drive F is King 8. That's the name of my flash drive serial number. This is what's on my drive. Dates, times, these are directories, these are folders. These are my folders on my flash drive. If you've got text files, you'll have text files, whatever. You can space them out free on your drive. I'm on my F drive. Um, if I wanted to create a folder on my flash drive in Windows, I would just right-click New Folder. We're not in Windows, we're in DOS, we're in Command Prompt. And I've got these on a handout, but let's write here MKDIR. What do you think that does? If you know it already, don't say it. What do you think it does? If you've never seen this before, what do you think it does? Make directory. It'll Mortal Kombat directory. It'll create a directory. It'll create a directory. And you have to tell it the name of the folder. So make directory, MKDIR, space. Let's just call it uh, some project. Notice I'm typing it all lower cases and no spaces. I can type it with capital letters and spaces. But if I want to do that, I should put it around quotes. Quote, my amazing project, quote. And the problem with that is that once we are in the command prompt and we need to go into folders and out of folders, you're going to need to type again what you typed. So if you called your project something weird like 2016-02 space 1 ABT capital space I parentheses, I'm going to need to type that every time I want to enter or exit a directory. My advice is keep your folder names simple so that when you type them, you have to type something simple and you don't misspell it. 
MKDIR, and what did I say? My whole project, whatever I said. Type whatever for a folder name. We're making a folder. Make directory. Enter. You don't get any, oftentimes you don't get any feedback unless it's negative. If you did it wrong, it'll tell you. But if you did it right, it doesn't oftentimes tell you. To confirm that I created my device, how do I look in my flash drive again? DIR. And I've got a new directory, a new folder, my cool project. I want to change <coughs> into that directory. CD space the name of my directory. And I did say you're going to need to type it exactly how you typed it, but there is a shortcut. If you start typing the name of your directory, and then press tab, it'll fill in the rest. So the problem is if I've got my cool project, my cool animation, my cool story, well, it's going to select the first one of that alphabetical <coughs> list. So it doesn't always help you that tab. It helps you a lot, but if you've got folders named exactly the same, I've got 2016-3, and another one, and another one, and another one. It doesn't know which one to pick, it'll pick the first one. But we type CD, and then the name of your folder, or just tab. Start typing a little bit, and then tab, enter, DIR, there's nothing in the folder. And we would type taco commands, but let's say we're in this folder, we want to move to another folder. I'm in this folder, my cool project. I want to exit. I want to leave this folder and get out of it. We would type cd space dash dash dot 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 not dash dash dot dot full stop full stop period period. Type that, press enter, and that'll back you up, back you out, out of that folder into this top folder. So whenever you're in a folder, you want to get out of it. Cd space dot dot. Back to the F drive. I'm showing you this because we need to sometimes navigate into and out of folders in command prompt because we're going to spend our time here. Not just in the safety of icons. Let's get back into that my project again. CD my cool project, enter. Let's type taco create test02 space com dot your last name dot test02 like how my handout says, we're going to create a brand new Cordova project. Taco makes it easy. Creating a new Cordova project with a folder, whatever we want here, with a unique ID, or else it'll give us a generic Cordova ID. Com dot your last name dot the name of the folder. And if you don't have a website, don't worry, you can make this up. But it has to be in this format. The extension, the main name, and then the dot, the name of the project folder. Space, open quote, end quote. And then uh, get used to using the arrow keys on the keyboard. I still see a lot of people that don't even know this. Arrow keys on the keyboard are going to let you go back and forth, because this mouse might not always do what you want. I'm clicking here, but it doesn't go there. Of course not. It's a mouse. So arrow keys. It works in Notepad also. In the quotes, I will type the name of my project as I want it to appear actually on the device below its icon. Capital test 02, space 02. So my icon on my device will show test 02, just like I wrote it there. I can type whatever I want. But obviously, you're going to run out of space there because you've got those other apps. Think about all the apps you use and think about how short their names are. Question? Um, oh, 
um, so the folder name, like, it, should it be like the a folder name or like the name of the app itself? I would say that's the same thing. The name of your app, uh, which appears right here, this is technically the name of your app according to Google. Okay. Same name as the name of your folder. And this icon name here is for people to see. That's what Google will see, the name of your project. At that point, then press Enter. This time it should go a little faster, but now notice it says there's the name. See, it's done now. Good. It says the name of your project, the icon name will be test two. The ID that is unique to the App Store is that. It's found at that location on my flash drive. And it's using a kit, Taco Kit 3. Don't worry, it's the default. It works. Success. I've got error. Oops. OK, I'll check you in just one moment. Question? The ID, is that something you get from the App Store? No, you make it up. You just make it up right now. It's unique. You will know when you submit it. And it exists. The reason usually there's no problem with that is because it's based on this domain here. You might not have a website, and you don't need a website, but how many other Jones will there be with that app name? How many other Smiths will there be with that name? So it is unique, but it'll tell you if it's taken. If there's any errors, check your spelling. Because this has to be typed exactly as it as I have here. Uh, got comma is in the period, and can I do, do it again? Yes. Um, here's a shortcut for everyone. Don't do this, but if you press up on the keyboard, it brings back your last command, and up brings back the previous one, and the previous one, and the previous one, and down goes forward in history. So Shengdar, right there, press up to bring back right. your last command and then fix it. So if you're typing something wrong, press up on the keyboard to bring back the last command. Press escape to cancel it. That's going to save us a lot of typing as well. Pressing up, pressing tab. Um, so the next steps, again, it's telling us here, which we did a moment ago, we need to be inside of the project um, that we just created. We created a folder called My Cool Pro I should have called it My Cool Projects. All my projects are going to be here under My Cool Project. And then inside of there, I've got all my apps. I just created an app, which is test02. The following taco commands, Cordova commands, have to be executed inside of the project folder, test2. How do we get in a folder again? <coughs> CD space the name of the folder. T E, I'm tired of typing, tab. Start typing a little bit of the name, tab, and then it completes it for you if it recognizes it. <clears throat> CD, space the name of your folder, enter, and now here it tells you you're in your project folder. This time let's add taco platform add browser. Browser is one of the ones we can use. Remember, we can simply type Taco Platform, and it'll tell you all possibilities. Taco Platform Add lets you add all of those possibilities. If we no longer want the browser project, Taco Platform Remove Browser. If actually we don't want to go off and create a BlackBerry app, okay, Taco Platform Remove BlackBerry. Taco Platform Add Browser. Press Enter. It's adding the basic source code for a browser. Specifically, Google Chrome Browser. You need to have Google Chrome on your computer for this to work. It won't work with Firefox or Safari, IE, nothing. Because Google Android, Google Chrome, it's all one big Google family. And therefore, you need the Google Browser <coughs> for you to use this one. So I've installed this one. The browser is basic. You don't need install recs, install requirements. Uh, plugins will do that. 
later. I'll <coughs> build, don't worry about that. Build the app. Let's do taco build browser. The template file will then be compiled for the browser platform. Press enter, of course. That one goes really fast. Then I want to taco run browser. Taco run browser, enter. You get some feedback. Eventually, Google Chrome should pop up. And this is again device ready. The point of this is sometimes it's going to be faster to test your projects in Chrome than to actually launch the emulator or go to your device. It's not going to be perfect, of course, because when we talk about the camera, we need a camera on your computer. When we talk about vibration, when we make something vibrate for an error, your computer's not going to vibrate. Uh, some things you can't fully test on the browser, but this will be useful to do some quick tests, because we are no longer going to be able to be in Notepad and do run Firefox, run Chrome. It's not going to, we've got Chrome there, but that's not going to run an Android project. It's going to run it like a web page. This is no longer a web page, it's an app. So we have to edit our code in Notepad, save it, and then we come back to Node, and then we do <laughs> Taco Run Browser. And then it'll launch the browser and make it behave like an, uh, like a, like an Android device or an iPhone device. Um, to make it feel even more like a real device, try this. On Chrome, on your keyboard, press F12. That brings up developer tools, remember that. And then developer tools. And then on the on this strip of icons here, or tabs, the second icon, toggle device mode. Click on that. So then it's going to show you a screen that's a little bit more like a device. I haven't selected an actual device yet, top left corner. And I'm going to select the last one, which is the Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy S4. You might need to reload the page for proper user agent spoofing and viewport rendering. Great. I'll reload it. And there's me testing my project, that blank project that gets created every time you do taco create template file on that virtual Galaxy S4 in Google Chrome. Or what does it look like on an iPhone 6? Like that. What about on a Nexus 10? Like that laptop with touch. Okay. Nokia Lumia 520, if you're doing Windows phone testing. So this is another way to test your projects. And here we've got this console output. So this will be very valuable. Console output. When we do JavaScript, we're going to get errors. We'll check our errors here we'll still be able to use Google Chrome with our device. Was it in this class that I showed off that I plugged in my phone and I controlled it on Google Chrome? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we'll, next time. Next time. I'll definitely tell you. Next time. It's a handout. That's right. To reload is the button on the top left corner, which is this little spinning arrow. Notice uh, one weird thing. I hope they fix this on a future version. But if I go back to command prompt, it's giving me a bunch of feedback. But there's no prompt here where I can type my next commands. It's zoomed by over here somewhere. 
here it is. I did taco run browser, blah, 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 control C to shut down. So to get out of this sort of like, you know, hiccup here, where I can do more, I have to cancel my current command. So on the keyboard here, press control C. It says, would you like to terminate the batch job? Press Y, and then enter. And it takes you back to accept a new command. It was stuck in a spot where it was showing you the results on the emulator. And you couldn't give it any more commands. So you have to stop that command, control C, to cancel. Confirm that termination, and then back to more commands. So there's a lot to think about here. Um, let me put in uh, some more handouts into the folder. We'll take a break if you want to print any of these, and then we'll come back. Uh, it's 8.50-ish. We'll take a break until 9. I'm going to put some more handouts in there, and I'll turn the printer back.